The Lost Streets of Brighton in the James Gray collection. My name is Mary McKean. That's a picture of me you can see there for those who don't know me already. Um, I've put that picture there because I need to apologise. I have not put a floating image of myself on any other slides in this presentation um, because when I tried to do that it obscured other images. So this is the only picture of me you will be seeing. I'll be I'm pleased to tell you and uh, it does show me where I'm sitting just at the moment and it does show me sitting in front of images from the James Gray selection so it does seem to me to be appropriate. The James Gray collection as most members know is a collection of seven and a half thousand historic photographs of Brighton and Hove which the Regency Society owns. Um, the collection was made by James Gray during the second half of the 20th century and um, the photographs themselves extend from about the, the 1850s until about 1990 and they cover the whole of Brighton and Hove. The James Gray collection sometimes feels like a peripheral activity to the main work of the society, perhaps because it deals so extensively with the unfashionable humdrum past as shown in images like these of ordinary places and I'm, um, places I might have walked past and failed to notice at the time, but which nonetheless demonstrate the character of a place. We in the Regency Society are often concerned, rightly, with the present and the future. However, having now worked closely with this collection for the best part of three years, working on a project to create a new website for it, I've come to think that there's much to learn from what it reveals about the past and clues it gives about important decisions and how changes come about in our city, much, is much of which is relevant to today's issues. We talk today of the housing crisis. There's been a housing crisis of one sort or another throughout the past century and beyond. In 1921, Brighton was the second most densely populated county borough in the country after West Ham, and as a long established town, a good deal of its housing was in worse condition. The problem of housing the poor is endemic, and the James Gray collection provides interesting glimpses of the scale and some of the efforts to address it. Slum clearance was the main reason for the eradication of entire streets in Brighton from the late 19th century onwards. The zeal of local public health officials, elected representatives and planners, and the availability of funds from central government under successive national legislation resulted in the wholesale demolition of large areas of Brighton, mostly in the mid 20th century. Whether such a sweeping approach was always necessary or in the best interests of the people who were displaced, has been the subject of much subsequent debate. Much has been learned in Brighton and elsewhere about what happens when entire communities are compelled to give up their homes and in many cases disperse some distance away in unfamiliar surroundings. I've looked at some of the images I will share with you in this lecture and many others beside and, what there is, and whilst there is clear evidence of dreadful living conditions in some, this is not, it is not at all clear to me in others and this makes, has made me wonder what might have been. It also makes me wonder about the impact and unintended consequences of such widespread and, and drastic action. This lecture can focus only on a small sample of the images of lost streets to be found in the collection. There is material for a book on the subject if we were to look at everything. I'll focus on a few important areas where streets have been lost in the mid 20th century which may suggest lessons for us today. Before I start, I just want to explain a bit of background. Um, my father was a civil engineer and during the 1950s and 60s, he was much involved in the production of pre-stressed concrete, very much like the building material of, it was very much the building material of that era. I have early memories of expositions at the dinner table extolling the virtues as a building material of concrete. He was something of an evangelist for it. I have been much reminded of these conversations when preparing this talk, since much of what has replaced the lost streets has involved a great deal of concrete. He was clearly not alone. I have a particular memory of, a of factory Christmas parties for children, where we would pick our way across what seemed vast areas of piles and beams, like the ones on the left, 
to get from the works car park to the party. The work he was engaged in included the creation of blocks of flats like the one in the centre at Birkenhead, which were believed at the time to hold the answer to the problem of the housing needs of the poor. We've learned much in the intervening years. I've used this book and I commend it to anybody interested in the history of the poorer areas of Brighton. Backyard Backstreet Brighton is published by Queen's Park Books and it's a compilation of two books, Backyard Brighton and Backstreet Brighton, both of which were originally published in the 1980s. Backyard Brighton focuses on memories from the 1930s, Backstreet Brighton in the 1950s. Photos come from the records of the then Brighton Borough Council Environmental Health Department and are designed to show those features of unfitness upon which the cases for clearance were based, i.e. most demonstrated elements of disrepair, dampness, poor lighting, poor ventilation, poor sanitary arrangements and bad arrangement, whatever that might mean. They were used more for demonstrating unfitness both internally and within the council than for any other purpose. The great value of this, this book is the insight it provides into the way people felt about their lives on these streets. I shall read passages from this book at various points during this presentation. So, early slum clearance. Um, this is an image of Titchbourne Street, which runs between Church Street and North Road, just to the west of Gardner Street. James Gray writes, on this site until about 1870 existed two streets of notorious slums known as Pimlico and Pim's Gardens, uh, vividly described by Dr N.P. Blaker, then house surgeon to Brighton and Hove Dispensary. These hovels were so foul and insanitary that in the early 1870s Brighton's first slum clearance got rid of them. They were replaced by the houses seen in these photographs. A century passed and some of these houses were showing their age. This was photographed on the 25th of June 1978. All the houses on the west side had been removed and some redevelopment should now be possible on a large, uh, large site between Titchbourne and Bread Street. And that has now happened as is shown in this 2018 photograph. So the first area I want to look at is Churchill Square. I have here three aerial views of this Churchill Square area at different dates. The first is from Aero Films. Um, the, second, um, is, and the, the second is from the James Gray collection um, of the first Churchill Square iteration from the late 1960s and the third from the second constructed in the 1990s. And one thing that you can just see in common between all three is, is Marks and Spencer's There It Is There and There It Is There and There It Is Again There. So that's Marks and Spencer's on Western Road. So getting our bearings in relation to Marks and Spencer's, that's a 1936 image on the left. Um, and you can also see on the right what it looked like earlier this year. And uh, what's interesting about the one on the left is the way Western Road looked uh, before the first Churchill Square iteration was uh, emerged. Um, and this is a digression, but I thought it might be interesting. Uh, whilst we're on the subject of Marks and Spencer's, this is the first store in Brighton and most people will recognise what's on the site now um, at the corner of North Road and Gardner Street. It was opened after the end of the 1914-18 war and was known as the Bazaar, selling household items and clothing at a very cheap prices. The shop was closed in the mid-1930s, soon after the present large store in Western Road was erected. The year of the photographs is not known, but it's obviously in the 1920s. So this is a map of Churchill Square. Throughout this presentation, I'll be showing these maps. The one on the left um, is the Ordnance Survey 25 inch map, the various years in which these were produced between 1892 and 1914. And the one on the right is open street map, so a present day map. And you can see where Churchill Square is here. Um, there's Western Road, there's West Street. Um, and in that area, there were very many little streets. The ones that have names on this map on the left are the bigger ones. Um, and I'll look in more detail at one or two of those. Ah, before I move on, um, 
Churchill Square was built on the site of slum clearances undertaken from the 1930s until the 1960s. The streets were not cleared to make way for the shopping centre. As with many streets, they were cleared because they were designated slums. In other words, their undesirability was the main cause for the widespread demolition, which often left places derelict and used as car parks for many years. So I want to look first at Blucher Place and the wonderful Suzanne Hinton has for the project attempted to show exactly where this was in this little photograph here. And this is Blucher Place. So we're looking at approximately here on the right hand image of Churchill Square. And here are some pictures of Blucher, Blucher Place. Um, the one on the left is in the late 1930s. The, remain, the, remainder, the remainder are all during the clearance in the 1960s. And I have to say, I rather like the look of the picture from the 1930s. I mean, I do wonder what state it was in and we have no way of knowing. But that does look to me very much um, like uh, a Georgian terrace. And it, it was in fact constructed, I believe, in 1822. So it was almost Georgian. Um, the two images in the middle are of a different house um, and I have a newspaper cutting about that house. Uh, it's uh, from the 6th of February 1960 and it's entitled The Fight Between David and Goliath. Uh, it's, I think it's the Brighton Gazette was the newspaper at the time. Uh, Widow claims compensation for loss of house. It's, the lady in question was Mrs Edith Annie Taylor and she was seeking compensation of £800 for the loss of her house. And it was clearly a big battle and that house remained um, on its own for some time. Mrs Taylor, who is employed in a nearby brewery, said she paid £360 for the house in 1929. Nine years later, the house next door was demolished by the corporation and this exposed the east wall of her house to the weather. The damp is now so bad that she cannot use her top room. But the house is centrally situated for her work and the shops. Where are they going to put me? Right out in Woodingdean, was her complaint. The estate surveyor said Mrs Taylor's property had not been modernised and it would not attract a buyer who wanted to modernise. This was one as a row of poor terrace properties and it would never attract such a purchaser. The, cor the corporation tends to pay less than the market value for a property if they can. It is not the sort of property ever to attract anyone who wish to buy a centrally sited cottage and do it up, um, the surveyor commented. Mr Grant said the properties which formerly adjoined Mrs Taylor's house were redeveloped. He added, sorry, were sold to the corporation on the threat of compulsory purchase or redevelopment. He added, it is rare for a property owner who alleges that the property is worth £800 to venture to fight the corporation. So that gives you insight to a number of perspectives at the time. Um, the picture on the right is of the absolutely ubiquitous car park, which happened all over these streets once the houses had been demolished. I now want to move on to Artillery Street and we have another photograph from Suzanne Hinton to try to show exactly where this street was. It's cited in the current Churchill Square complex here. This is Artillery Street um, and it was one of the main uh, streets in the Churchill Square area. And on the left there is a picture of a house on Artillery Street and on the right um, the scene as viewed from Blucher's place. It looks across Upper Russell Street to the west side of Old Artillery Street with the Grand Hotel in the background. Uh, and these are more images of Artillery Street. And I have an excerpt from Backyard Backstreet Brighton to read from, from somebody who lived there. Um, the person who lived there and um, gave us this quote um, is, ah, I don't have the name. I'm sorry about that, um, I put it somewhere. But anyway, I will continue. Um, this person was a child at the time. Um, at 8 Blue Hill Place, there was a very big yard which was shared by three houses, numbers 8, 9 and 10. 
my friend who lived at number eight and I loved singing and dancing. We were always in the shows at our school, Middle Street School. We used to go along to Giggins and buy stale cakes. You could get a lot for tuppence. Then, with all the little kids in the street, we used to go to this yard and make a kind of tent out of clothes horses, sheets and things. We sat all the children down and gave them stale cakes and lemonade made with lemonade powder. Then my friend Joyce and I used to sing and dance. Moving on, um, she says, everyone was neighbourly in Artillery Street and children seemed much safer in those days. I remember my childhood with affection and remember the times when we all went to the Hippodrome on a Friday night. And she also says, I don't think that we were poor. In fact, we were probably better off than many in the area. We always ate well and I had some nice clothes. Some streets in the area seemed poorer. Cannon Street seemed poorer to me as a child. The children seemed more ragged than we were, but perhaps I'm mistaken. Other streets, such as Grenville Place and Cannon Place, seemed to be more wealthy. The lady's name was Pat Sprintall, I have now found it. And the last street I want to look at in Churchill Square is Milton Place, which is a tiny, tiny little street just north of Luca Place. And again, we have a, a picture from Suzanne. Um, and I've included this one because it contained a rather lovely building. Uh, Milton Place was constructed in the 1820s, including this house. And James Gray says of the picture on the left, um, a rear view of Milton House as it appeared in 1842. This is a photograph of a drawing by Mrs. Tupper, whose son lived in the house. The house still stands, though very much changed, and much of the large garden is now covered with garages and similar outbuildings. James Gray says, compare this scene of desolation with the drawing of the house and garden. There had obviously been an extension of the house to the south and the garden had for many years been covered by these old garages. It was photographed on the 6th of December, 1964 and these buildings were demolished just a few weeks later. I think this sort of story is kind of typical of what was going on at the time. And there's another couple of pictures of Milton Place. Um, the one on the left is 1957 and the one on the right 1964, more car parking as you will see. So I now want to go on to a major redevelopment area, Carlton Hill. Um, clearance of this area began in the 1930s and continued for some years. Edward Street, and that's Edward Street down there in the older map, and here on the modern map, uh, just so you get your bearings, and here's Pavilion Gardens, Victoria Gardens, and in the same place on the left-hand map, just so that you get an idea. Um, Edward Street and the surrounding house, housing was cleared from, the, from this period until the 1950s, with sites left derelict for some time, blighting the area and much of that to its north for many years. Edward Street was widened and made a dual carriageway at its west end in the 1960s. The law courts were constructed in 1967 and the first Amex house in 1977, now of course demolished and replaced further up the hill. And within Carlton Hill, I want to look at John Street. Now John Street is still there. So in a way you could say I'm cheating, but it's changed so much that as far as I'm concerned, it's disappeared. Um, James Gray says of, of the view of, um, on the left, uh, and here we see Edward Street and John Street, the, the junction between them. Um, it shows Hawker's, Hooker's Baker's Shop and the small house number two John Street occupied by William Hooker. And of course now what we have there is on that corner is Job Centre Plus. And there's Job Centre Plus again, but this time with an image of um, a house that had become dilapidated in John Street. And that must be, I would think, probably um, 1820s, maybe that house. Many of those houses were from that sort of period. Uh, and this is the other end of John Street, right at the top. Um, the tall building had been a beer house known as the Old English Gentleman. The site was cleared and not occupied again until 1937. Once more, the site is now empty, so part of the blight in that area. And of course, 
on that corner now, we have the new Amex building. The main road there is Colton Hill. And William Street, uh, again, this is a street which is still there. It's the other side of the law courts from John Street. Um, and there's a picture of it in 1934, which I actually find quite interesting. Um, it was originally named North Steen Street. It was built about 1815. So this is real re Regency. Many of the places that we call Regency were actually constructed after the Regency had ended, not this one. Uh, it was renamed later after William, Duke of Clarence, later William IV. Um, James Gray acknowledges that this street has always been poor, but uh, this was a rather good looking terrace of Georgian housing, in my view, which predates these other squares, predates Regency Square. Um, and it's also only a stone's throw from the Royal Pavilion. And then in 2019, what we have is yet more concrete. Um, this is the side of it's just underneath the uh, magistrate's court's car park and this is part of the police station and all of these buildings are also part of the police station. Um, I just wonder, is it an improvement? Um, and I won't answer that question. This is another picture of some doorways in William Street um, and as James Gray said, it, this street contains some fine doorways and bow windows. Although this photograph was taken in 1930, these doorways are still existing in 1957, he says. The houses shown are 16 and 17. William, um, 15, sorry, 16 and 17 William Street, and they provide us with good examples of early 19th century doorways. They were not to be found on any other houses in this street, though the design over the door was used in houses of comparable age in Carlton Street. So if we move on, go up the hill to Mile Street. Um, Mile Street has, didn't disappear entirely. As you can see, I've ringed the little bit of Mile Street that remained after Amex was, the first Amex building was built over its southern end. Um, and in this little bit which remains, there are actually two rather lovely houses which now look squarely onto the side of the new Amex building. This is the, the contrasting scene, a close-up view of the large Flint house, 33, on the east side. Um, this house is worthy of being restored and preserved despite the redevelopment going on all around. In 2019, Ruthie Martin commented that 34 and 35 Mile Street were listed in 1952. They're thought to be a former farmhouse. The semi-detached cobble-fronted house is still a delightful discovery when exploring the Carlton Hill area. And of course now it's on the edge of the Carlton Hill conservation area in which if you choose to wander around and take a look, there are other Georgian houses. So that's Mile Street in 1972 and the rump of it looking upwards in 2019. And curiously, of course, the current proposals of the, the, the Edward Street quarter, and they're no longer proposals, there is an advanced stage of construction, will reinstate Mile Street um, from Edward Street upwards. So that's a very unusual case of a lost straight street being reconstructed, but I suspect it's not going to look much like it looked before. Um, and I don't want to give the impression that I believe that um, Demolition of all of these houses is questionable. I don't think so. There are many images in the James Gray collection of poverty, overcrowding, and urban misery and of a dreadful kind. Uh, and I'll, I'll just show a few slides demonstrating these without too much comment. There are many, many in the James Gray collection. I think one of the saddest is the one on the right on this side of the very ironically named Sun Street which ran to the west of William Street, which we looked at earlier. Um, it is very tall, it is very, very narrow. It ran north-south, so I imagine that at the middle of the day when the sun was up, it got a bit of light, but not for very long. So Sun Street is a very 
unfortunate name for it. And here are some more. Um, you can see how overcrowded and dilapidated the housing looks and how on top of everybody else people were forced to, to live. Um, and an image of children in Upper Park Place in front of a flint-fronted, not a nice, I think, flint-fronted building. And again, um, houses often separated by hardly enough space to put in a privy. Uh, life was not easy and people did not live in any kind of comfort and it was a rough area. Um, the police used to go around this area apparently always in twos. But these are the problems which are associated, in my opinion, with poverty. And I think poverty is the key issue in what we're looking at here. Um, moving on to another area. Uh, this area refers not, to, uh, not just to the New England Quarter, but to the larger area bounded by London Road, New England Road and the station. As with the other areas, housing was cleared in the 1950s and left derelict with the result that much, it, with, that much of it became blighted until the new master plan was approved in 2001. So I want to have a look at these two streets here, highlighted in red, which have in fact really disappeared. Elder Street and Elder Row. We still have a little bit of Elder Place left. If you go up these days from the uh, London Road car park, and you're going to the Duke of York, you probably have cut through Elder Place. But these two other streets, very, very close together, have disappeared. So on the left is uh, Elder Street, and Bill Kosher's picture in 2018 of the site of the end of um, Elder Street. And you can see um, St. Bartholomew's Church at the end there. And in 1955 also, that's um, Eldon Row. And um, James Gray um, says that Elder Street was separated from New England Street by narrow Elder Row. The name was derived from the elder trees which grew here earlier in the century. In, in the century. He says Brighton lost very little when this narrow passage and houses were demolished in 1958. Um, and he may be right. I mean, he saw them. I didn't. Um, but oh, they don't, just don't look too bad to me. And I think maybe I'm taking against some of this redevelopment as a result of this work on this photographic collection. So another street in the New England area, Boston Street, which was just up the hill from Elder Street and Elder Row. Um, a truncated portion of Boston Street still exists. And it sort of runs parallel to New England Street, but up the hill from it. So Boston Street views, that's an image of Boston Street with one side of it standing in 1959 on the left. At the top, um, this is the picture of the road going up to Boston Street in 1954 and that's still there. Bill Kosher took a picture in 2018. It runs up the side of Brewers and if you parked in Brewers car park then you will have parked on what used to be part of Boston Street. And what's interesting here is the view um, across Brighton and including the demolished Elder Street and Elder Row in the foreground and many other houses falling into disrepair by the look of it. And finally in this area, what happened in uh, the early part of this century, Fleet Street, shown on the left there, just adjacent to the, the railway goods yard, has actually moved. And that's an unusual thing to happen. Um, it's actually on the site of Kingscott Way. Um, and Fleet Street itself has moved slightly to the west. Um, so in 1967, this is a picture of Fleet Street as it was then. And James Gray says, south of New York Street, seen in the distance, was Fleet Street, or rather what was left of it. The, it was built in the early 1850s, and originally it contains 26 small houses, 14 on the west and 12 on the east side of the street. In 1905, they all went, with the exception of these two, um, photographed on the 12th of February, 1967. 
At the time of this clearance, the roadway was widened, this being the reason for the removal of houses on the east side, many of which had basements. The two remaining houses have lingered on for more than 60 years, but will go with the others in the redevelopment scheme. Fleet Street was one of many streets in this area, which were named after City of London streets. And in 2018, of course, what we have now is a walkway rather than a street, and most of the dwellings on King's Cutway are in fact flats. It was first occupied in 2007. So having looked at all of these areas and many others, uh, as you will have guessed from what I've said, I do wonder whether it was really necessary to demolish all this housing. And I've also wondered and looked into what happened to all of the displaced residents and what we can learn that might be useful for the future. And in answer to the first, um, I, I'm, as you can tell, not sure that it always was necessary. Um, the justification for demolition from the Medical Officer of Health in the 1930s used this par paragraph, which was sort of a sweeping statement offering all sorts of justification for knocking down just about everything in a particular area. Um, and there doesn't appear to be any consideration of, you know, actually, could we do something about the problems of damp, the problems of infestation? the problems of layout, and, many, and in many cases, maybe we couldn't. Um, but I think there was a strong feeling that the best thing to do was simply to get rid of a whole area. Um, and I'm sure people meant well, but I'm not sure it was always justified. So what happened to the displaced residents? Um, those, as I've said, those who were directing the rehousing probably meant well. However, things didn't always go according to plan. Estates were constructed in various areas on the outskirts of the town. Homes fit for heroes was a motto adopted in some more colourful writing of the time. It was written of Moulscombe in the 1930s, one of the early schemes. This layout is situated in an exceedingly beautiful hollow in the Downs, and it is due to the steepness of the hillside on which it is situated that a very informal system of planning has been adopted. There are many examples in Sussex of villages nestling in the hollows between downs where a continuous green traverses the whole length of the village and it is rec with recollections of these beautiful valley greens that the central feature of Moolscombe has been designed. Okay then, um, that's what they felt at the time. Uh, there's a picture of the Lower Bevendine estate also from the 1960s and this picture of Whitehawk in 1976. Um, and this is, things did go wrong and they went seriously wrong. Rents were high and many couldn't afford them. Vacancies for some private properties in, in, as part of these redevelopments were eventually advertised in, London, in the London press, producing local anger and squatting and sit-ins and protests. In 1933, 21% of tenants from Carlton Hill who had taken houses at Whitehawk had returned to Central Brighton for financial reasons. A lot of them couldn't afford the bus fare to go to work. And there is there are plenty of accounts of people who couldn't afford to heat these houses and couldn't afford to feed their children. And what's more, they'd lost their roots and they'd lost their communities. I mean, this was a serious problem. For me, not all, I'm sure some were grateful and some coped, and some were very happy to have moved out to these other areas. It's not a, a, a one-size-fits-all sort of story. Um, but this image shows the earlier 1930s Whitehawk estate, which was later replaced with more cost-effective housing, including the tower blocks that you can see at the rear. So, you know, there was a sense of realism, but really what was provided originally was not up to the job. So what have I learnt for the future? The basic issue was, and probably still is, in my view, poverty. Poor buildings may need to be replaced and can sometimes be refurbished, but expecting people to put up with whatever accommodation those of us with power choose to give them without first addressing this underlying problem runs the risk of failure. I think that's a, a big lesson. Um, 
Another one is that community and neighbourhood is precious. I take this from reading the accounts in, in the back, Backyards Backstreet Brighton book. Um, people need to be near other people they know. We do harm by destroying this. Many of the problems encountered and hardships suffered in rehousing could have been avoided if better care had been taken to understand the needs, wishes and feelings and also the financial realities of the proposed residents. Are we any better at doing this now for social housing than we were when, when the interwar and post-war estates were being constructed? I'm not sure that we are. I think that people who run things make decisions on behalf of other people without really knowing what the consequences will be sometimes. And finally, unless we strive to promote real quality in new buildings, we risk simply creating the slums of the future, and I think that's a very real issue today. So to conclude, I will just say something. I talked to about my early life in concrete. There's also stories from my later life in concrete. Um, but you may or may not be wondering why I've put up this picture of, of Josip Tito, the leader of Yugoslavia, effectively from the end of the Second World War until his death in 1980. During 1990, I was working for the British Council and was set to the task of visiting various centres in Yugoslavia with a view to establishing British cultural centres for teaching English to adults. There was a huge demand for this following the fall of communism. It was an interesting task because I visited in quick succession and met officials in various important cities in what was then the Federation of Yugoslavia from Skopje, now the capital of Northern Macedonia, with its strong Bulgarian and Albanian connections and powerful Ottoman history in the south, to the strongly Western-facing Ljubljana with its Austro-Hungarian past, now the capital of Slovenia. It was clear that trouble was brewing between the various states where, where war broke out shortly after I left. Loathing was evident on all sides of the others, and I remember wondering how Tito had managed to keep a lid on this simmering stew of cultures for so long. I remember looking out of a hotel window in Sarajevo onto a large public square, now falling into disrepair with green shoots appearing where the concrete had cracked. I'm musing that a lot of concrete in the form of tower blocks of the sort illustrated here in Belgrade had been poured on the impoverished and ill-housed population, and that this had kept things quiet throughout his presidency, though things fell apart very soon and very spectacularly thereafter, causing me to conclude that human nature is more durable com commodity than concrete. This image has returned to my mind several times whilst preparing this presentation. So some quotes in this talk are taken from a wonderful article by John Boughton, creator of Municipal Dreams. That's a book published not too long ago, uh, but the article in particular is on his blog and it's called Brighton's Interwar Council Housing Estates, Housewives with Empty Larders, which says a lot. Um, and I recommend um, looking at that to anybody who's interested. Um, contact me please to correct any errors I've made and also to ask questions which I will try to answer or I'll refer you on to someone who probably knows more than I do. Please use the address given here and thank you for listening.